that's exactly what I said. If both of them actually are void, then you would be true when you get that. So, okay, you can also follow that. I also said that already. So these are the two fixes. We talked about the deep twin possibly later today or next week about the deep twin. It's actually about object copies. You will need that for writing your contract, you will see. Okay, after comparison, once you fix all the two problems, you actually pass the test, get a green bar, and I think this is just like a recap of what a design is. But somehow you have to show, so this is a client supplier relationship. So somehow this is the bond diagram, somehow you want, so this part is actually gen, uh, generated automatically by Hyper Studio. What you have to do usually, after you have done your design and coding, you can generate something like this by Hyper Studio, and then you have to redraw them with contracts in Visio. That's what you have to do for the submission. If you simply give me this, you lose 50% of the marks. <coughs> okay, that's the uh, deal. Okay, so in this case, we're saying that the account is actually a descending class of any, and transaction is a descending class or child class of any. So by default, all the uh, classes are the child classes of any. And now we're saying that the account is actually, is actually using the services from uh, transaction, okay? Because in the account, we actually have deposits. So this is like a history list of all the deposits we have done so far on the account. And the type of the list is actually transaction. So we are really using the transaction in the context of account. So that's how you draw this arrow in the bound location. Whenever you see this, arrow, this kind of arrow here is inheritance. When you see this here, it's a uh, client supplier, okay? That's typically the two uh, relationship you will need for your design. We'll see another one from expanded class for, uh, for aggregation. We'll see that later in the slides, in the second slides. Okay, bound diagram. So this is what you should get for your submission. So we'll see one example later, but for this slide, you can get some flavor of how the bound diagram looks like. So we should give uh, like what to what inherits from uh, what this class inherits from, and also the invariance, and also for the feature we have to give the require and ensure classes. Yes. Uh, just to be sure, the double arrow points towards the client. Yes. Uh, yes, exactly. Let's say in this case here, yes. So this is a client, and this is the supplier. Yes. That you can think of this is like a uses relationship. So this account uses the surface of transaction. Okay, that's a bond diagram. You can see that's the inheritance and that's a client supplier. And that's the class location here. And then you also have to include the, uh, you can see here you have the pre precondition, what to be satisfied beforehand and what to be satisfied afterwards, the feature, the pre and post condition. Okay, so later on we're actually going to see how you can apply the predicate logic that you learn from 1090 to write complete contracts. Okay, so the contract we have seen so far, like a balance equal to O balance minus A, is like a toy example, basically. But we're going to see for more sophisticated software, you can write more complicated contracts for the uh, design. Okay, we're going to see how you can use it for all and exists. So for those of you who actually forget about the, uh, for all the exists, please do review them. We're going to uh, use them very soon, possibly next week. Okay, uh, this is like, a, again, to mention about the information copying. So here, so we, we always have the public part and secret part. So secret is subject to change. Let's say whether you're using, uh, let's say in the bank account example, you might be either incrementing the balance query using a function which means it will be calculated based on the deposit and withdrawal history. Or you will be implementing the balance using uh, as an attributes, which means you have to update the attributes in every command, okay? So those implementation details are ir irrelevant to the clients. So that's, so clients only care about what's above the C-level. Whatever that's below is you as a supplier, you should, you should make sure you have followed the, uh, the good coding principle to make sure it's maintainable and extensible. Okay? As far as the clients are concerned, they only concern about the public part. Okay? And now you can see secret parts about the choose of representation using an array, linked list, hash table, 
clients don't care. And also, implementation of public features and private features, yeah. So you may have some auxiliary routines to help you develop your software. You also do that in uh, Java. Okay, so this is a very brief mention. This will be actually your lab exercise tomorrow, actually. So let me just briefly mention that. So in here, you can see, remember this arrow here is the inheritance, which means my stack inherits from abstract stack. One of the features that are actually de declared in this class here will be inherited to my stack, okay? The star here means, in the Eiffel term, it's called deferred. Yes. Good. Good. I think you know that from maybe a default exam or something. Yes. Like that, right? Yes. Good. 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 Yeah. Okay. So basically, deferred is more like abstract in Java. So deferred means it has some of the some of the features undefined or deferred at the moment. And later on, if the descending classes do not choose to define that particular deferred feature, then that class will be deferred as well. If that particular class implements all the deferred defer feature that, uh, that it inherits, then you'll be called effective. So these are the two terms you should know, deferred and effective. Okay, so now here is a principle for you to follow. It's called the uh, code to interface, not to implementation. Okay, so that means you as a client, so now let's say these two classes are available to you, right? So abstract stack and my stack are both available to me. So now I want you to know in my code, My stack? My stack? How come? Because it's implemented? It's implemented, that's true. So you can actually directly instantiate that. That's yeah. true. So you can say, for example, create, let's say, stack. Let's say, stack. <coughs> let's say, make empty. That's how you think, right? Depending on how you're going to use it. <laughs> yes, yes, okay. However, that's the wrong answer. You shouldn't choose the second one. That's okay. That's a good try. Thank you. So, the first one should be better. Okay, I'll tell you why. Because let's say, many, uh, in many places of your client code or your code, you're trying to use this stack. Okay? So now, let's say if you follow this, okay, I'll choose for that version one, version two. For version two, put it here. Maybe it's sort of we uh, we draw the diagram right here. So that's the abstract stack. We use reverse. So this inherits from. Okay. 
interface, and this is the concrete class that implements the services that's supposed to be implemented. Right? Okay, now, you, there, will be, there, there will be nothing to stop from this class to implement new features in this concrete class. So let's say it provides some very handy feature that's called that maybe, uh, uh, let's say, second part. Just, let's say this is your stack. So this is always your top, but sometimes you might want to know what's the second top. Or to be more general, you want to know what's the, uh, uh, what's the third top or fourth top, etc. Let's say second top should be sufficient. Let's say you find this particular feature very useful somehow in your code. So that's why you decided to actually declare this, att this attribute here, stack of my stack. So later on, in your code, you can say stack, stack dot, um, second top. That's how you use it, right? Okay. Uh, this second top, or somehow to delete that feature, right? In which case, what, what's going to happen? That means it's going to affect all of your code where you actually use this uh, feature, right? Because that feature is very specific to this particular stack. Because in the abstract interface, there's no such feature here that's defined. In a concrete clause, you can always add more specificities if you like. There's no constraint on that. So from the client's point of view, if you choose a particular implementation here, you have no guarantee that any new, fe uh, any additional feature that's available now, they will be, they will become unavailable later. Okay. So let's say later on you might have some other implementation available. So let's say this one here is my stack two. Let's say this is a so this is a first supplier. This is a second supplier. What they are in common is they all have to increment the push, top, and count. But besides that, they can add whatever new features they like. They, they don't have to agree with each other. Yes? Is there a difference between the two arrows? The ones colored in and the ones? This should be colored. Thank you. Very good. OK. So these two classes, actually, both, both of them have to increment the interface. But for anything that's additional, they are, not, they are uh, totally unconstrained. Okay, that's the point. So, so that's why this is actually not good because you are depending your code completely on the, this particular implementation. Okay. On the other hand, let's say if you chose to for the first one, for the first one, that means you get a guarantee that you always get the basic features for the stack, push, pop, count, and top available. Okay, so that means whenever uh, you, can, you can also easily change the bindings between them. So let me show you what I meant by bindings. We're gonna talk about that as well later on. Oh, it's good to talk about the syntax now. Let's say I'm not talking about the uh, first one. Okay, in my phone, if I try to say create stack dot empty. If I say that, there will be, you can try that actually, there will be a compile error because you're trying to say this is actually a deferred clause. So you can directly instantiate that. It has something that's uh, un un incremented, right? What you have to do is to give a particular binding to say to which subclass am I going to bind this object to. So let me show you the way to write this typo. This is correct syntax, so you better write it down. So, so here, this is syntax. Okay? In some way, this is more like a, well, I shouldn't say a cat, but it's a little bit like that. Okay? So this is curly braces here. So here you can fill in either my stack two or my stack one. So you can easily change the binding. So let's say somehow this my stack one is implemented by array, and this one here 
is decoded by, let's say, leaflets somehow. And it turns out, let's say, the mind stack too is actually more efficient. And you want to adapt your code into this particular implementation. There's only one single place you have to change in your code, which is this particular part of the binding. You only have to change from stack one, from my stack one to my stack two. Everything else remains the same. Because for the rest of your code, when you're using this particular stack, the features you can use from there is constrained by what's, uh, what's defined in the abstract interface. Okay, let me recap, okay? I know this is a long discussion, but it's very important for you to know. It's a very important principle. Okay, so that's yeah, basically what I said. So the second one, either because you think that's incrementable, so you have a sh uh, you have this line to the right as opposed to that one. And also, there might be some unique features from that particular child class that's available to you at the moment. However, that feature is not defined in the uh, interface, okay? Which means that feature is not necessarily supported in other subclasses of the abstract stack, okay? So later on, let's say somehow this particular implementation class decides to hide that feature or just to make it obsolete. In which case, your code where you use the, that particular feature has to be totally refactored or changed. So you are severely affected. However, if you chose the first one to begin with, then your client code will look like this. So you actually have to say, now I'm trying to initialize some stack, and now I'm actually telling you which uh, implementation class I'm choosing. Okay? Like it can be either my stack one or my, my stack two, depending on what implementation you have. Now later on, you, in your code, you can use this stack only with the features that are actually defined in the interface. So let's say, now you somehow you found that the uh, my stack one is buggy, it has lots of errors. You want to switch to another implementation. In this case, you don't actually have to worry about any interface compatibility problem. All you have to do is to change this binding from one to the other. So it's really about the maintainability for your code. So that's why I said choice one is better in the long term than the second one. Okay? That's uh, basically it about this principle here. <coughs> Think about it. If you find it confusing, talk to me tomorrow or in the office hour next week. You, let's have a 10 minutes break. We'll continue after the minute.